What's going on, engineers? We're back with another game automation, and this time it's going to be Simon Says on Android. And to accomplish this, we'll be using Python and the Python ADB client library. So let's just jump in and see what kind of high score we can get. So for those of you who don't know what Simon Says is, it's a memory type game whereby you're given a sequence of colors and you have to repeat back the same colors. Each time you succeed, it'll give you one additional color. So we'll start by clicking play here. You'll see that it picks red, so then I'll have to click red. Now it'll do red and then blue, and then I have to do red and blue. And then it just goes on from there. So next time it'll be three, red, blue, blue, and I'd have to click red, blue, blue. Of course, if you get the sequence wrong, then it's just game over. As you can imagine, there's tens if not hundreds of these games on the Google Play Store, so I just downloaded the one that had the most downloads. As I was brainstorming the approach for this game, I had to overcome the challenge of needing to read the screen basically in real time. In the Stick Hero video, I also read the screen, but I did so just by taking a screen cap with ADB. The problem with that is taking a screen cap is very slow. And the only real way I'm going to be able to make this work is if I can read it fast, because you can see that it just flashes really briefly, so I need to capture all of that, I need to capture exactly when it changes. Ordinarily what I would do is I would just capture the raw frame buffer with ADB, but for that I would need a rooted phone, which I do not have. So I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to read it directly from my monitor. As I said earlier, and like the Stick Hero video, we'll be using the Python ADB client. So I'll simply put this in here, and this will give us access to the device through ADB, and it'll allow us to run commands on the device as if we were touching it physically. The first thing we need to do is capture a total of four pixels, and it's going to be the pixel right in the middle, the green square, the red square, the yellow square, and the blue square. Those four pixels should be the only thing we need, and that'll make sure that we're able to sample the pixels very, very often. To get the coordinates I'll need to look at, I'm going to use a nifty tool called XDO tool, get mouse location, dash dash shell. I'll put my mouse over the green, run it, put over the yellow, over the red, and over the blue. What we can then do is take this data, get it over into our editor, and get it ready to put into a dictionary. I'll start by removing the excess stuff we don't need. And the way we need to represent these values is a left top width and height. So we can start by doing the left value, which will be this, the top value, which will be this. Then we can specify a width of one and a height of one. Add our curly braces, and then we'll need to give it a name. So the first one's gonna be green, and then yellow, and then red, and then blue. And put some equal signs in there and that will be good. We'll be using MSS to create the screenshots. Well, they're not really screenshots, they're just single pixels, but we'll be using MSS to do that, so we gotta create a new instance of that. Getting the actual pixel is pretty easy. It's simply sct.grab, and then we specify the coordinate. Then what we can do is wrap that in numpy.array, which will give us an array of the actual pixel, the RGB values. We'll set that to call it green pixel, and then we'll make four more of these for each of the colors. Now that we have all these ready, it's probably worth printing these out just to make sure everything's okay. So we'll do each of these here. I'll come over to our terminal and we'll run it and see what happens. So these appear to be the right colors. We'll bring over our color picker here and we'll just look at the green. The green is 50, 184, 44. They are backwards, but that's fine. All we're gonna need is a couple of the values anyways. And of course, if we check out the yellow, that looks correct. The red is also correct and the blue is also correct. So this is showing us what we need. So the only value we actually need is actually the red value, and I'll explain why that is. We don't actually have to detect is the color value there. All we have to detect is is the color value not there. And to do that, we actually have to detect the blue background behind the four colors. So the reason the red value is really helpful is because if we go over the green, we can see we have a pretty high red, 44. You know, for red, we have 180. For yellow, we have 179. And for blue, we have 43. But if we go on the background, we have a red of 3. And that's just because it's a really dark blue. So for the purpose of our program, we're gonna say the button is pressed if the red value is below like 10. So because this 44 is the only value we need, which is going to be the third element in a list, which is within a list, which is within a list, the way we're gonna have to subscript this is, we'll call it like green red value. It's gonna be green pixel. It's gonna be the zero and then zero and then two. And then as usual, we'll duplicate this three more times for each of the colors. So next thing we need to do is actually detect whether or not a square is pressed. And as we said, if a square is pressed, it'll have a red value of below 10. Now during my testing, I did find that because I'm capturing data so fast, there's a chance that 
the actual pixel will come back all zeroed. So rather than try to throttle the speed down, I'm simply gonna just check to make sure it's not a zero. So instead of just less than 10, we're gonna do on a range of one to 10. So that's pretty easy to represent. We can just do if one is less than or equal to green R, which is less than or equal to 10. And then if it does find it, we'll do print detected green. Better yet, instead of having it print something, I think I'm gonna create a function called like detect next. And then what this will do is this will be a function which is called, which will just wait until a square is pressed and it'll return that value. So rather than printing it, I'll simply return like a G for green. And I'll need to duplicate this three more times for each of the colors. And I'll copy these into here. And of course for blue, it'll be B and R and Y for yellow. And then because it's detecting, I'll need to run it in a loop so it runs until it detects something. So I'll put a while true there. And then I'll put a ever so slight delay just to keep the detection rate consistent. So if all goes well, we should be able to just print out detect next and then run our program. And it should give us either G, Y, R, or B depending on which one it presses. So we should be able to start a new game and then let it pick one. It'll pick red, so that'll be fine. What I can do is I can run the program and then when I click red, it's gonna do red again, and then it does R. So it actually worked really well. It detected the next color that was pressed. But why stop here? Why detect once? So let's just put it in infinite loop, and we'll just detect forever. So we'll come back over here, we'll run it again. I know it was blue, I'll pick blue. Yeah, see, it did three Bs and three Rs. That's a little too fast. You know, I can do BR, and then it'll do it again. See, but that's too many, two, two, and two. So we're gonna have to find a way to make that work. The reason it's duplicating is because it doesn't know when to stop detecting. Basically, as soon as it detects blue, it just loops around again, and then it sees that it's still clicked. This means that the game likely shows it in the click state for about two to 300 milliseconds, but we don't wanna actually try to time it perfectly, so we'll have to find a better way. And the best way I thought to do this is to basically change the function so that it looks to make sure the button is in the unpressed state before it starts watching. Modifying this is pretty simple. We're gonna introduce a new variable called detecting and we're gonna set it to false by default. And then we'll introduce a simple conditional that just says if not detecting, then just continue. Basically don't actually check it and don't return. So checking to see if the squares are in the unchecked condition, it's actually pretty easy. It's just the opposite of what we've done down here. So down here, we're saying that it's in the pressed position if the red value is between one and 10. So in the unpressed, it's just going to be greater than 10. So what we'll end up doing here is if not detecting and green underscore R is greater than 10 and, and then we'll do it three more times for each of the colors. So if it's not currently detecting and all of them are in the unpressed state, then we'll simply set the detecting variable to true. So let's see if it works. We'll start a new game here and then we'll run our program. Now it did blue, so I'll click blue. It should do blue again. You can see it does B, B for blue and blue. So I'll do blue, blue, does B, B, and then G for green. So you can see now it's only doing it one at a time now, which is exactly what we want. So now that we have a function that does a really great job of just detecting the next color that's pressed, all you really have to do is just do the logic for actually processing the moves. So we'll need two variables for this. The first one we'll need is a moves variable, which will tell us how many moves it should watch for, because it'll do one and then it'll do two and three and four. So this is just gonna be a simple increment. And then we'll need a list to hold the actual moves that we'll need to make. So in an infinite loop, which will represent each of the rounds and an in iterator for i in range moves, we will then detect the actual next color that it sees. And once it detects a color, we will append it to the colors list. And just for debugging, we'll print the value of colors just to make sure everything's good. Now, because when you play the game, once it tells you what colors to press, you can't immediately press the colors, so we'll have to introduce a short delay of about one second. And it's at this point that we actually have to make the touch action on the phone to pick the actual color that we want. So it'll be a simple iterator for color in colors. And then in here, we're gonna detect what color is what. So if color equals G, then we'll have to do device.shell input tap. And then this is gonna be the X, Y value of where we wanna tap. So for the green, we'll come over to our thing here. We'll put it right in the middle of the green and it's about 265 by 470. So we'll put that here, 265 by 470. 
And just to save some time, I filled out the remaining three colors along with the remaining three XY coordinate pairs. And then the very last thing we'll need to do is simply increment the moves variable by one and reset the colors list to empty. And I think it's time for our test. So we'll go to the terminal, we'll start our program and we'll click play. We'll take our hands off and we'll watch it work. So it sees Y and then it pressed Y, the score went to one. And then Y blue and it picked Y blue, the score is now at two, Y blue blue, Good, scores at three, Y blue, blue, red, and it's good to go. Scores at four. So it's on round 10 now, and everything still seems to be fine, seems to be working. So we'll just cut it off right here. I did let this run earlier. I stopped it at about 31. As you can see on the leaderboard, I currently hold the number one spot at 31, and the previous person only has 17. But so sorry, beautiful carp, you are just no match for Python. However, I fully expect within a couple days of this video being released that these scores are much, much higher and somebody dethrones me. Anyway, that's all there is to it. If you have any questions or comments about anything you saw in this video, please make sure to leave them below in the comments. Also, I came up with and implemented this approach in probably a combined maybe 30 minutes. So if you have any improvements or if you have a better way you think I could have done this, definitely let me know in the comments below as well. This was a really fun project. In fact, all of these Android automations have been really fun, and I really hope you enjoyed watching. Other than that, hope to see you on the next video. Take care.